Now before the video starts, there is some things I have to discuss with all of you concerning the future of the channel, and of course concerning this series, and it's all mushy stuff so I'm gonna make it as quickly as possible because you obviously want to get onto the main topic of the video. So first off, thank you. This series has honestly been so fun to make and such an amazing learning process for me, and clearly all of you really enjoyed this series. And by the way, the growth has been absolutely insane despite the fact that that whole YouTuber problem of don't let the numbers go to your head, but whatever. I can still be proud of the growth as my channel has actually grown over 10 times the size as it was before I actually started the series. I remember a time when I was stuck on 36 subscribers, could barely make 10 views on a video. I was lucky if I could get five. And now all of you are showing this love and honestly the support has been insane. All of you have clearly shown me that this series has been received well, but like a lot of things in life, unfortunately, and this is actually a really sad day, I'm surprised I'm actually containing my emotions very well, is that a lot of things come to an end and so is this series. This of course is the last commander in the game and Blizzard has announced that they are actually stopping production of any more commanders. All of this, all of this here that you see on my channel that I'm capable of is all possible because of you guys. I honestly can't thank you guys enough for all of this. It really means something like really special to me. As it goes for the future of the channel, I am glad to say that this style of video that all of you clearly like will be returning and will cover different games as the StarCraft 2 series comes to an end as there really isn't a lot of other things on StarCraft 2 that I enjoy as thoroughly as I do co-op. Some of you have actually complimented me in the comments saying that I'm the only StarCraft 2 content creator that isn't allergic to editing, which <laughs> is both funny and true at the exact same time. So again, this style of video will stay. However, there will be other formats of video and other games that I will be introducing to the channel. So honestly, the only thing I can really ask all of you, all of you watching, the only reason why this series has the quality level that it has and has the consistency that it has is because of your guys' support. Again, this all would never be possible without you guys and especially your input. The best thing all of you can do is leave in the comments how I can improve. Both positive and negative reinforcement do something for me and change the channel in a good way. Whether it's criticizing me and showing off all my faults or praising me for actually doing something different. Everything contributes. So the best thing all of you can do is leave feedback because this series wouldn't be here without it. Also, as it concerns for upload schedule, I will try to upload a video every week, every Saturday at minimum. So make sure to keep note of that. Now, if I ever state that I am not going to have a video up at that time, I will announce it in my Discord, which the link to it is down below in the description. Now, one last thing before I go, in the comments, for everyone that has made it here and watching this video, I honestly want to ask you before we actually get into the contents of this video, is that... Out of all of the commanders you've seen at the both at the end of this video and all previous videos I made, leave in the comments what is your favorite commander and why, or when you play the game, because again, the game is free, what commander would you like to play and why would you? I honestly want your feedback. I love communicating with you guys and really understanding what makes you love this mode so much. Now, with all things being said, I'd like to thank you once again. I keep saying thank you. <laughs> really hope you all enjoy, and I will see you all in the next one. Hello ladies and gentlemen, and of course people who don't carry their weight and have to rely on idiot spammers like me to do the heavy lifting, do I have a proposal for you concerning StarCraft 2 co-op? Would you like to give away all forms of freedom for supposed security, absolutely hate the idea of free speech, love getting shot for insubordination, and rather be worked to the bone and thrown into the meat grinder which is also known as conscription? Do I have a faction for you? Join the Terran Dominion today, where your safety is not guaranteed and you will be worked to the bone with absolutely no opinion on the matter whatsoever. Now you might be wondering, what evil nutcase runs this faction suppressing the human spirit to be free and thrive? This of course is the practically prehistoric psychopath with a bit too much love for high caliber explosives and death in every inhumane way possible. Arcturus Minsk, a man that rules over the humans with an iron fist. 
And also in this case, you are not mistaken, this flag is supposed to be a whip, not a power symbol. It's almost as if this is some sort of mystical yet very obvious foreshadowing that's gonna set the tone for the video in almost all of his methods. Who knows? The final commander in the series, and one of the most versatile commanders to ever exist, with a strong and numerous army. Elite units that tear apart all types of enemies with specializations against, well, everyone. And abilities that describing it as overkill wouldn't be overkill enough due to the sheer amount of pain you can bring down with these abilities. And for those of you who know this reference, Minsk and the Terran Dominion is kind of like the Imperium Man from Warhammer 40k. It is universally a terrible place to be in while you're being fed propaganda that you're the good guys and you're never done anything wrong in your life. However, God forbid you don't have any thoughts against the seat of power since insubordination is not tolerated whatsoever and you will be shot. As you can tell, Minsk is a very likable guy, but he always wasn't like that. See, at one point in time, Minx was a freedom fighter who fought with Raynor and Kerrigan. However, as most of you know the saying, die hero or live long enough to become the villain. Minsk is hated very much by these two as he has ordered the calling of an entire world to prove a point and left Kerrigan to die. For some anonymous reason, Raynor is really upset about this. Thank you, Jim. For everything. That would explain a lot, actually. You guessed it right, Arcturus Mink is not only a commander that doesn't really make sense for being here, but then again, this is co-op, not a lot of this is supposed to make sense, but he is the last commander out of the entire game because Blizzard refuses to add more commanders for some unknown reason. Now, we would normally put this to the fact that, oh, maybe they're work on StarCraft 3, but I highly doubt it due to how the campaign ended, which I'm not gonna spoil it here. Now, before we go into the actual content of the video, I really hope you all enjoyed this video and give it a thumbs thumbs up and subscribe if you like everything I'm doing and everything I'm doing in the future. Also, if you need a guide on all of the previous commanders in this entire list for both the good and bad reasons of each commander, there is a link in the description for a playlist for them there. Now let's move on to the reasons why you clicked on this video. What is his kit and what the hell you're supposed to do with it? I will however be going into the mechanics of the kit first as if if I went through abilities first it wouldn't really make any sense and you would need the mechanics to explain the abilities which of course defeats the whole purpose of the video video of explaining what to do, now wouldn't it? Now looking over all of Minx, which is generally a really bad thought that I don't know why that just came out of my mouth, he is a very versatile commander due to his kit that has access to both expensive and very cheap units and abilities. Hands down one of the best commanders in the game, and he really doesn't have a bad point for his units or abilities or mechanics. The only really big issue with Minx is that his army needs to be diverse in order to be very strong. So don't get me wrong, spamming still works, otherwise I wouldn't be playing him and wouldn't even be making a video on him in the first place. But combining his mass infantry with his elite units and his unparalleled destructive capabilities with both units and abilities and mechanics makes him a deadly force that everyone should be scared of, that even though he technically still shouldn't be here, my point still stands, he's powerful. Now first we look at his base, which is rightfully called a recruitment center. And as I've already mentioned in his video, the flag is symbolizing a whip. And his workers are called laborers, which should realistically just be turned to slaves and the recruitment center should just be called a conscription center. Let's be honest here, he's just signing up people to die. Training 8 units max for both his basic infantry and laborers, which can later be upgraded to drop anywhere on the map, as that is one of the main ways of moving around that expendable flesh wall around the map as fast as it does. Now what makes his units unique is that they are interchangeable as they can swap their job between a fighter or builder slash resource gatherer, making it very easy to both build and repair in battle, while the economy is really easy to set up, and even when it comes down to setting up the expansions is extremely fast and faster than almost any other commander. Now when you choose to swap their jobs for some or all if you choose, this can be done into two types of buildings. One of course is the recruitment center and the other one being the unique and the other being a very unique building to his kit which is why his mechanics are not just about numbers and stats they're also about buildings is the, of course the supply bunker a defensive position building that both passive and active uses it is both a supply depot that can increase your maximum population while also being a building that's overpowered due to its defensive situations of being a bunker having troops stack inside and really absolutely gun down all enemies with increased armor compared to other structures and four and eventually six troops with their upgrades still contained can be put inside of this thing with increased bonus to range and survivability making these things a must-have for even offensive maps and much and even more so defensive ones. 
weapons. Now for the players that are looking for long range and heavy firepower, I present both with the Earth Splitter Heavy Ordnance. Looking exactly like two AK-47s pointed at the sky, let's be honest here, having very long range, but not unlimited, so it does require placement in the middle map or placements that are strategic for its range. Affecting a very large area with very low accuracy while dealing tons of damage to ground units caught within the blast. However, the reload is a bit of a problem. Every time you put a troop inside of it, that when you put all four troops inside, it becomes a rapid fire artillery that is able of dealing heavy damage. The only time this really really, really, really becomes insanely strong despite its very slow fire rate even with all four troops inside because again it's an artillery piece is that when you have oh I don't say one compared to nine, twelve, twenty of these guys absolutely clobbering the map and covering the area in explosions that is just a little bit too powerful. And now we move on to Minsk and his abilities. The entire reason why he is labeled as overpowered and even that's an understatement. So to start off, each ability is going to be costing Imperial Mandate. Imperial Mandate is generated when a certain unit of his arsenal, whether it's cheap or expensive, and the game will entirely switch from not generating enough Imperial Mandate for the abilities and eventually generating too much Imperial Mandate for the abilities and the cooldowns now become a problem. Really weird and completely different from every other commander. Costing 25 Imperial Mandate is Force Conscription Ability. Now Minsk is most versatile ability by far, dropping a supply bunker onto the field filled with, and I quote, six unfortunate souls to do fighting and utility. Not only for adding to your army in the field and extra population, but establishing a defensive position around the map and those troopers can turn into laborers for repairing and building advanced base expansions. Best used in the field to increase army size and effectiveness while also making it easy to set up expansions much easier, which explains why he's the fastest growing economy out of all of the commanders. Now the next ability completes the whole tyrant look as could you really label Minx as an evil person if he wasn't using inhumane methods to actually get his point across. This ability solves a problem which is called the contaminated strike. You can probably guess what it does. Dousing the area of gas dealing damage over time and makes enemies run in fear for a certain amount of time. This ability of course is only good under heavy conditions as this ability is entirely reliant on earth splitters as in you can't even cast the ability if you haven't even built one. Now with their low accuracy it means gas is only going to be effective if you rather A, get really lucky in a roll of the dice, or two, you just have so many earth splitters that you completely cover an area in gas and every single one is going to hit. So very powerful and really good at causing chaos and destruction to armies, but against fortifications it's not really that good. Very powerful ability, but under heavy conditions. Now for sheer chaos and varying levels of cost is the Dogs of War. A legion of uncontrollable zerg of different types that, like me, don't think, just do. Attacking the closest target, whether it's the cost and intensity vary on how much Imperial Mandate you have available. I find it best to save up for the higher tiers as the lower tiers for the abilities is good to spam, but it's not really that worth it. At 25 Imperial Mandate, you summon 30 uncontrollable zerglings. Good for harassing, but not really durable in any way. At 50, you will be able to summon on top of that 10 hydralisks to deal damage with ranged attacks and mainly hit air units. At 75, you will have the addition of 10 more mutilisks, which will grant air coverage for both air and ground, while at 100 Imperial Mandate, you will now summon 5 ultralisks that tanks most of the damage and deals just as much damage back. I recommend casting all of this on the inside of enemy fortifications and attack waves to weaken defenses for your mainly controllable army to move forward and do the heavy lifting. Now the last of the abilities, and the entire reason why he's labeled overkill, of course, is the nuclear annihilation ability. Dropping a nuke on the map, and as if that already wasn't enough, before it drops, dropping 40 tactical mini nukes on top of the very large area, deleting everything inside almost instantly then dropping a nuke on top, just as if that wasn't enough. But unlike the Dogs of War, this ability starts at 100 Imperial Mandate and is only fully unlocked at level 13. Very powerful against all targets, but I recommend only using against certain instances since the Imperial Mandate cost is high and the cooldown is not really anything to be proud of. And that is quite it. The last few and the last time I'm doing it, it honestly feels weird. Anyways, with the 
technical and abilities out of the way, now we move on to the cannon fodder and the elite, which of course is the main piece of Minx and his kit that makes up his army being the units. Very powerful, in certain conditions, it depends how you play. Now before I get into all of Minx's units, aka the way I should be using them, and I don't for reasons I still can't explain after making 18 episodes of this, but each unit is divided into three sections. First is the basic units, which are most likely going to be cannon fodder. With numerous numbers, they make the backbone of Minx's army, the most versatile units however needs constant replacements if you know what I mean. Support units, however very small in numbers, makes up for the team in massive ways like keeping them alive or drastic buffs, and it's the true key to Ming's success. The last of course is the elite units, with stronger versions of basic units that are specialized for a certain job while having their own XP system. The more they're in combat, the stronger they will get. Starting out with the basic units being the troopers, expendable, cheap, and numerous with large amounts of customization versatility. Now they'll make up most of the numbers in the total army and the key for generating imperial mandate to cast those powerful abilities. Now obviously they are the combat versions of the laborers slash slaves that still keep a piece of their building equipment. On the battlefield while still in combat form, they are able to build supply bunkers, missile turrets, and heavy artillery, making them a a little bit too powerful if you ask me, turning every single firefight into their advantage by building structures to support them. The versatility and customization options comes with the weapons they hold. By themselves, they are basic units with a quite shitty SMG, average in every single way with a little bit less range than I would like. Costing a whopping 160 minerals per gun is the choice between an LMG, a flamethrower, and a missile launcher. Costing quite a bit early on and with a death gimmick of dropping on the ground for another soldier to pick up. The gun will always exist and will always be in circulation. However, the person who holds the gun is always going to be changed for reasons I should not need to explain because it's pretty obvious. First is the Dominion Assault Trooper with the LMG first. There isn't really much to say about these guys. He acts like a normal trooper except having slightly more range and dealing double the damage, which is just an amazing all around unit. Then of course there's the Dominion Flame Trooper, burning enemies inside their own skins specialized for dealing damage to light units and infested maps. Giving away their SMG in other words disables their capability of dealing with air targets, but being much more close to range having an unrivaled amount of damage while also having increased armor and health. The last of the basic troop of course is the rocket trooper still keeping their smg which means they're still able to deal with ground targets not as amazing as the flame trooper or the assault trooper but still really good however unparalleled in its anti-air capabilities now the missile launcher itself doesn't actually do a lot of damage but it has a very high fire rate their real power actually really comes from the fact that when you have a large amount of these guys i swear to you no air unit will survive within range. It is ridiculous how strong these guys are when they're stacked up. Now next up is the elite guards of for the emperor. Very powerful and built to handle certain problems and most importantly to actually survive a fight. As they level up, not only will they rank up, but they'll also get a gold star to signify it. First of the elite and built from the barracks is, is the Aegis Guard. A much more powerful marauder built for sustained combat and cracking armor on bigger and larger targets. With the only basic upgrade unlocked the 15 to slow enemies down on every hit by 60% to almost completely stop enemies, which is really, really good for their very minimal fire rate. Upgrade ranks at level 1 to get a barrier that absorbs 300 damage. At level 2, you'll deal shrapnel damage to all enemies behind the initial target. And of course, at rank 3, getting access to high grade stim packs, drastically boosting the attack speed of the Marauder by 200% for 10 seconds. These guys should be comprising most of your elite guard, unless you're facing air units or you are on the defense. The next unit is still made in the barracks, but requires another structure to unlock. It is hands down probably his least best unit, as there really isn't a single one of Minx's units that are terrible, as this unit mainly relies on abilities, but you'll see why it's an issue. This, of course, is the Ghost, the Emperor's Shadow, with an ability for everything. Yes, it still can attack regularly, but the money and the true value of it is in its abilities with the pyrokinetic immolation that deals damage to biological targets, and of course the EMP that disables mechanical units. However, much different from their traditional cloak, every time they get hit, they essentially become invulnerable. There isn't really much to say about these guys as most of their protection method is, well, gone. With a very minimal amount of hit points, they aren't really amazing, and when their energy runs out, they are basically useless. With rank one being the cloaked ability, as I've already mentioned, in level two and three is a quality of life changes, like 50% more damage, 
against biological targets and stunning, while draining energy from mechanical units and dealing damage to targets with an energy bar. Very niche if you ask me, but not phenomenal in any way. For the defense, my second favorite elite guard unit and first of the mechanical units is the shock division. An elite guard siege tank capable of dealing long range death to all ground units, there really is no better unit for defense if you ask me. Best used with supply bunkers to hold off the hordes while the dark god with superheated tungsten from very far away. Deploying much faster than normal, also shared with other units, deploying 66% faster while on the defense for a steep price if you ask me. Rank 1 is capable of stunning targets on each hit, while massive units just get slowed down because realistically a little explosion isn't going to bother them too much. Level 2 increases the range and vision while level 3 increased the area of each blast by 40 percent massive improvements to ensure death is dealt equally to all across the battlefield dealing damage to air for the defense comes at kind of a problem assuming you don't have missile troops occupying those bunkers the black hammer is here to solve all this problem as you would imagine its power is actually found when it's deployed folding onto the ground and becoming essentially an anti-air turret an absolute monster that is capable of dealing massive damage all air targets as i've already mentioned before it just deploys 66% faster and grants an aura of extra armor to all nearby ground units by five massive changes indeed. With rank 1 being a key upgrade as it increases the radius of its overwatch mode, the deploy mode, by 50, making killing so much easier while level 2 and 3 increase the range and attack speed by 33%. I can honestly only recommend this on maps that are defensive and emplacements must be used. Otherwise, I really don't recommend them as their walking around form is moved for transport and really nothing else. Starting at expensive and just moving up from there is the Sky Fury, an elite viking capable of transforming between a walker and a fighter dealing massive damage to all types of targets however mainly prioritizing on massive units now this unit overall is really fun to use it's very mobile and it's overall really good and versatile the problem is is when it comes to dealing with air targets or land targets there's always going to be a better choice than these guys but this is just a unit that can swap between the two now of course the first rank is actually unlocking that damage to massive units increasing the damage up to a whopping over 50 increase which is absolutely insane well rank 2 gives a huge upgrade to your transformations, a big damage bonus upon transforming for every five seconds. This means you will do massive damage while you are constantly switching. Too much skill for me. Let's be honest here. Rank three gives a drastic increase to its survivability, which it needs granting 50% chance to avoid all attacks and can save itself upon taking fatal damage while getting a barrier for 90 seconds. Keep in mind at the end of the day that this unit is not that great. And there are just better units for the job, but still amazing. And finally, the last of the elite guard units, and quite a popular choice despite the steep prerequisites, the Pride of August Grad, costing a very large amount to purchase and level up. For this, you get a mighty battle cruiser capable of dealing damage to all types of enemies, very effective, zipping across the map with a tactical jump while blasting large enemies away with the Yamato Canning, emitting an aura of increased range that's mainly going to be used for your basic troops and elite guard. Level 1 of course adds a new ability charge to each of your abilities, meaning you can tactical jump twice and you can fire the Yamato Cannon twice. Now normally this is not an amazing upgrade, but then again this is co-op. This is supposed to be overkill. Level 2 makes the Yamato Cannon now area of effect, which is absolutely ridiculous, while level 3 now fires twice on the single target as if one was not already enough. And finally, for both the series, because Blizzard is getting really silent when it comes to StarCraft 2, but whatever, the final section of units is the support roles. Now these units, you don't actually need a large amount of them, but they play a very important role. First, of course, is the Imperial Witness. Now I cannot stress this enough in saying that this is the second most important unit you will ever have. It doesn't attack, and doesn't do anything really important besides providing detection. Flying over ground troops, forcing Minsk's will upon them, generating Imperial Mandate for your abilities, which of course is going to be your main source of this energy, is going to be the laborers at your base. And occasionally for the troops in the field, depending on the enemies that you face, I would recommend it all the time, but to each their own. Doing this will jack up your Imperial Mandate regeneration to the point where it isn't an issue anymore. By the way, I'm not speeding up this clip. This is exactly how fast it can go. However, I would rush the upgrade for the Amplified Airwaves, which doubles the Imperial Mandate generated by laborers and troopers, which of course are going to take up the bulk of your army. As when the Imperial Witness is deployed, this means that all troops inside of it are going to get a 50% increase to attack speed, which is absolutely insane, especially when you're talking about the upgraded weapons. Now these guys are extremely important, I recommend 
two or three on each map, one for each expansion, and one to go with your army. Very important at all times. The final unit of his kit and of the series, of course, is a support vessel known as the Imperial Intercessor. I might have mispronounced that or whatever it means. I don't know. It's a fancy medevac ship that keeps your troops in the fight. Now, they provide a healing beam to all troops. Now, normally, these troops are fated to die, and you would be right, but this is like an act of mercy, and they get a bit of healing. With personal upgrades of a permanent cloaking for protection due to its flimsy amount of health, and a twin healing beam making sure all types of units will be able to stay alive and will reduce the casualties that will inevitably happen anyways. As you can see, there is a lot of depth and complexity to each unit, and to become successful with this kit just entirely for your army is to make sure you diversify your army. Yes, you can spam only one unit. It still works, hence why I'm still making a video on it. But the difference is, is how to really, really become extremely effective with Minx is your ability to have both support units, troopers, and elite guard all in one, and however you build that army up and what you need for the sake of your map or the enemies you are fighting. Do all that and you will be fine. Now we move on to the more basic yet rewarding system, which of course is the mastery perk system. Leveling up past level 15 and for 90 levels, you get access to small yet drastic changes to power up your commander. And with time and dedication, you can have this too. Don't ask how much hours that I have in order to get to my level that I am at. I'm ashamed of it too. Let's move on. Now, when it comes to power set one, it is a decision on how you want to get your Imperial mandate, a resource that takes the form of nukes or poor souls conscripted just for the point of dying. It's a choice of rather your troopers and laborers or from your elite guard units. Both are fine, however, I find it much more realistic to go for the troopers and laborers than the guards units due to the fact that you are going to have a lot more numbers not only for the sake of the price, but realistically for population space, it's much more practical to get your imperial mandate or at least the biggest portion of it from your troopers and laborers. Power set 2 is if you're very very focused on the style of using the top bar, which of course in other choices is to reduce the overall cost of the royal guards by a decent amount, or you can rather increase the damage of all of your abilities besides of course the force conscription by 30%. I can't really say anything bad about this as it each one of them was already overkill, and I can never really complain about more damage. On the other side though, reducing the cost of guards by 20% in gas, even though the number is pretty minimal and I would like it to be a little lower, getting these elite troops a lot earlier, therefore making them a lot more valuable for getting their XP and making them extremely strong as every time they level up, they get an increased bonus to damage and buffs. Power set 3 to finalize all the mastery perks is a choice between starting Imperial Mandate or Royal Guard XP gain. In all honesty, you really should be choosing the starting Imperial Mandate. An XP gain is great and all, but the main upgrades through level up, you're mainly going to be getting at level 1 and maybe level 2, but in most of the instances, you're going to be doing that and getting XP is already insanely easy with these Royal Guard units, assuming you're not being an idiot. However, having a starting Imperial Mandate of up to 30 allows you to have a much faster economy very early on in game as you are able to set up your expansion potentially right away if you choose to by deploying conscripted soldiers right away to add to the mineral collection. Now to end off the video of the old and powerful Emperor Manx kit is the Prestige System. Now, if you're unhappy about any of the mechanics that the hero currently has, you are presented with three other types to play that massively change a bunch of things and almost adding completely different strategies. Keep in mind that in order to unlock one, you must reset your level back down to level one and start right from the beginning again. A really hard sell if you ask me, and something that takes a lot more time dedication than I would like to. Now the first prestige is the Toxic Tyrant. So first thing I like to say is that I like the name about it, for some reason. Don't know why. Anyways. Toxic Tyrant is a specialist on the contaminated strike, making it better in almost every single way. Cooldown, damage, duration, cost across the board. This is a highly dependent on the fact that you are constantly specializing in heavy ordnance above a traditional army. The more ordnance, the more coverage you have over an area. However, it is more of a downside the fact that of nuclear annihilation. A really hard sell, but a decent one. Now the next one I can't really strongly recommend. I've heard other people say otherwise, but hear me out. Principal Polariate. I, 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 I know I'm not pronouncing that right, but that's the best I can do. A focus on the Royal Guards, which is very little gained in a lot loss in return. Again, hear me out. 
Increasing the XP gain by 100% as I've already imagined isn't really that amazing, but having a 25% reduction on gas price. Now the gas price is a really big problem. However, the problem or the trade-off of this is that you have a 100% increase in mineral cost for all units, which is really steep and I don't really recommend it in that. With how fast Minsk is able to get minerals, you quote unquote float on minerals, as in you gather more than you'll ever need. If you see the top bar late game, you have way more minerals than you'll be able to spend. But at the end of the day, it's going to make your early game extremely hard to catch up on, which is normally Minsk's strength and will have to rely on Imperial Mandate abilities, which as you all know, is not in high supply early on in the game. So again, this one's a hard to sell. Now the last of the prestige is the Merchant of Death. A fitting name indeed for the changes and even his basic starting kit. With weapons no longer dropping on the ground and overall cheaper, reducing that 160 cost to 120 is great. Massive improvements and is much more able to get your army a lot stronger earlier than you're supposed to be. Also, when weapons are dropped on the ground, they now explode, creating small explosions that are sure to wear down enemy forces and potentially kill. However, the downside of this is that you do not have any more self-sustain for not only your Imperial Guards, but for your basic troopers as well, as medevacs have been completely removed from your arsenal. A really hard sell that is a 50-50, it all depends on how you specialize. Just remember at the end of the day to expand your economy as quickly as possible while making large amounts of troops as their backbone of your army, while the rest of your army, depending on the map type of level you're playing and the enemies you're facing, to then make Imperial Guards, depending on those types of conditions. Imperial Witnesses are obviously going to be your key for success, as will actually allow you to afford the abilities that he comes with, making him just a little bit too strong, and again, overkill is just not enough to say. My final verdict overall for not only this commander, for this entire series and every single commander that I've covered, is that each one is worth the money that they ask for. Again, every single commander, not only can you actually get the game for free, but every single commander that you normally would have to pay for, whether it's in a pack or individually, you can play until level 5 and then they just stop leveling up from there. So even if you think that this video is not enough to sell you on a commander, you can simply go and try it out for yourself. That option is open for you as well. And after 18 commanders and 18 videos and an extraordinary amount of time editing and recording, the series now finally comes to a close. An inevitable one that I'm surprised that I'm, again, still holding it all together. But let's get past that mushy stuff quickly before I start to break. I'll leave it at this and say, this is Toxic Spill. I hope you all have a fantastic day. I hope you all found the video informative. I hope you all enjoyed the video. And I hope you all enjoyed this entire series as it is sad to see it go. And remember, do stuff you love. Toxic Spill, signing off.